Are you seeing things slightly different that you may not expect to get in a barbecue? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oysters. Okay. Now, I've got a question for you. Who wants a taste of Dallas? You're going to get oysters, but it's going to be a taste of Dallas, specifically the Gulf of Mexico, okay? Texas. To, uh, you know, for that to happen, you need to have a Texan on stage, and this is exactly what we have. This guy, right, co-owner and head chef of Smoke Restaurant, Chicken Scratch, Thai Quarters, The Theodore, Flora Street Cafe, co-author of the stunning Smoke New Firewood Cooking. I'm only halfway there. The People's Best New Chef is voted by Food & Wine magazine. A James Beard Award winner. You'll find him in the New York Times. <laughs> and the Dallas London. Morning News, the Dallas Observer, and I probably missed a ton of stuff out. Turn your back on this guy for one second, and he's turned himself into something else. He's extraordinary. Let's pin this guy down if I can for the next 45 minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, Tim Byers. Hey, guys. <laughs> well, thanks for having us. Can everybody hear? Where's the mic? Yeah, we can hear you. We All can right, hear you. good. Turn up a little bit, maybe, Andrew. Just a little notch. Notch upwards. Yeah, listen, dude. You having a good time? Totally. I mean, we're super excited to be here. Um, my uh, oldest son is with me, too. He'll probably be out here, Liam. But uh, we came for uh, Mutopia, the first one, and uh, have had a blast and, you know, happy to be back. So, you know, this kind of live fire thing, it's what I am, like, alive about. So it's cool to come and see thousands of people going crazy and having a good time. So... Now, I don't know how many people know the history of Metopia, but a very, very important person, almost the inventor of the whole thing, Josh Ozersky. Who's heard of him? Hands up. Yeah, good. We've got a few, few fans in the crowd. I think what's important is that uh, Tim, I mean, obviously Josh has now passed on. Yes. But Tim was a big pal of Josh's. And actually, you, when you came here first, the yes. first Metopia in London, Josh brought you over. And I'd like to talk a little bit about Josh. Sure. Give, give people a bit of a feel about him. I mean, who was Josh Ozersky? Josh Ozersky. Um, Real New York guy, uh, you know, super, you know, all about like eating, drinking, you know, excess and, and you know, fun all the time. So uh, it's unfortunately he passed, but he did pass in the midst of a food festival and all sorts of things. So, uh, you know, Josh is, a, is, is all about getting dirty and getting in it and having a good time. Lots of steaks, lots of barbecue, lots of, lots of everything. And I think he'd be really proud and amazed of how Metopia has kind of evolved and how it's developed in London, and what it's become. Totally, yeah. totally. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of this stuff, I mean, you wouldn't even see this sort of stuff in the States, because it's just, um, I was talking to my son, I mean, the interesting thing is, is we're like walking around on like cobblestones that are like older than our country, <laughs> in a 300 year old dock, with smoke everywhere, and no one's really highly concerned. I'm sure somebody here is concerned. But uh, it doesn't feel like it, so it's cool to be here. Let me ask you, because there's a quote about you, the man with the extraordinary capacity to keep reinventing yourself. Mm -hmm. Where does that come from? And, and w how many times have you done it? Oh, I don't know. You know, it's funny. They, were, they wrote an article on that. Because I'll, I'll like change food styles and stuff like that. I mean, I think I just get a little bit bored with things. I mean, I got into the restaurant business as a kid. Like you either like mowing lawns or like busting tables at a restaurant. And um, I caught the bug. You know, I was really excited about how there's this like spirit of hospitality that you see at events and restaurants or even if you're throwing a party at your house. And I knew right away that's what I wanted to do. So, you know, that's my thing. So, you know, I'm all about kind of, yeah, I think my best core thing is experience creation. So I'm all about new restaurants. I'm all about new food festivals. I'm all about this firewood stuff has been able to take me all over the place. And, you know, I'm the kind of guy that you could drop in the middle of nowhere on the top of a mountain and, like, build this grand spectacle of whatever. You know, my early career, um, I did well, all I was going to say, because you opened all these restaurants and then they, you know, they've closed down and you moved on. Yeah. Or you, yeah. So you don't well, hang around for long, John. Well, I mean, I mean, smoke was 10 years. I mean, you know, there, there's, you know, I think the thing is, which is interesting, it's like, it's like life, you know, you just keep going and learning and doing stuff. So I started, I went to culinary school right out of high school. Um, I moved to the city. I worked in the best restaurants. You know, I did all the stuff you're supposed to do. Um, moved to Belgium, um, moved to New York and like, you know, worked in some great hotels along the way too. So there's this like luxury hotel sort of thing. I mean, and I think that's what's great for me now is I have a, a I have the opportunity to be able, or the experience, I guess, to, to deliver amenity and see things that are, that are uh, you know, bigger than ribs and that sort of stuff. So I like to play the balance of, of all, over the, all over the place. I mean, one of the things we talked about with the, the, the previous demo and the previous demo is the importance of travel. Yeah. Okay, and you've touched on that. So that's 
quintessential to being a good chef, to being a good connoisseur of what you do. You've got to go out there. You've got to learn. You've got to experience. Well, uh, you know, I do. I think it's beyond just learning as like somewhat what you need to do for your career. I think it's like learning for life. One of the cooler things I got to do, um, you know, in the last few years, I was on the U.S. Chefs Corps, which is part of this, our state department. Um, the program's no longer around, but they chose 100 chefs. Each of us had our own specialty, and they sent us all over the world as sort of a diplomacy program. Where we'd be cooking with their indigenous people and doing festivals, speaking at university, that sort of stuff. So firewood being my thing, you know, they got to, I got to go to all the little crazy places like, you know, Kyrgyzstan and cook at the World Nomad Games and, you know, like where they're lighting fires 20 yards long with the slate rocks over the top. Um, got to go through South America, um, got to represent our food pavilion at the uh, World's Fair in Milan a few years ago. And all of this is about telling this American food story. It's just like here. I mean, it's such a multi, you know, multicultural melting pot. And I think the one thing that's interesting in America versus Europe is that, you know, we don't have this huge, huge history. So you'll go to, you're not going to go to a village that has an 800-year tradition on a certain recipe. You know, our stuff is like that recipe might come here, and then it's going to get to New York. It's going to travel, travel, travel. So Texas is a really cool thing for this is it's like this crossroads. So we're right on the border of Mexico, so we have all this like Mexican and Spanish influence stuff that kind of comes up. Um, we have a lot of uh, uh, Polish, German, um, a lot of just European like thing, people who have migrated their way and with them they took their food traditions. And so we have this really good way of blending things and I think that's what I'm great at. I mean, I'm not from Texas. I've been there 15 years, but grew up in California mm. and you know, which being able to look at food from this aspect too differently than your your base your your standard Texas guy, which is going to have a lot of rules in barbecue. I mean, you guys are barbecue fans, yeah. So everybody has a way of telling you how to do it, and everybody knows that this rub does this or this does this. So you know, I'll honor that sort of stuff, and I think it's respectful and fun. But I also think it's cool to do something different. So like these oysters we're going to do for you guys. This is my take on something I saw in Galveston, which is a which is our older port in Texas. Um, I was in a bar, a really dive bar that was uh, known for these oyster cocktails. We'll serve them in a pint glass, and uh, I looked down the alley to you know out the back, and there was this just stand up drum barbecue where they were just dr grilling these oysters right on top of it. And oh, well, they put it inside the pint. No, they just no, no. no the <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, it's like a chaser, you know. You go way down, then you have the oyster at the end. But I love the idea that it was that gritty and like in an alley, and uh, there wasn't all this fanciness around it. And I'm like, we got to take that, and we got to do something with it. So, you know, Texas is a very huge place. So when asked to t give you this taste of Dallas, um, you know, Dallas has a lot going on, and Texas is interesting as a state in the U.S. A um, lot of like people who were born there or have long family traditions. I mean, it's it's almost like a country country of its own in some aspects, but... Um, I mean, Josh called it the pinnacle, right? Well, so for... It, yeah, 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 but would you agree? I mean, is Dallas, you know, the barbecue center of America? You know, I think that that region is, you know, north central Texas. It's, it's like, you know, the Carolinas in the south. I mean, this is a tradition of American, um, you know, southern cooking. Uh, and, and I think it's like gritty, like humble roots is what that's all about. Um, Texas has its interesting thing. It has a Mexican influence. Um, we're going to do some chorizo and some other things, chilies, and talk to you guys about that today. Um, but like, you know, it, it's also was on this main cattle drive where they were, where, you know, the Spaniards did a lot of that before we were there. And so it, it's an interesting place. And I think that that's the crossroads. There's a Native American kind of thing. And then once you get really past Fort Worth, I think that's like the, the, the gateway to the West. So all of that, like romantic, big skies and m all of that sort of high desert sort of energy, that's in the far West of Texas, which is absolutely beautiful if you're willing to drive 10 hours from a real airport. Who's had barbecued oyster? All right. Where did you have it? So local, okay, but not many, right? Just one person here. Who else has had barbecued oyster? So uh, maybe four people. Okay, this is gonna be All good. Right. This is so gonna be good. We'll hopefully we'll turn it on to a few people. So let's have a little chat about what is going on here with this pepper okay. of different foods and ingredients? All right, so we're going to do a couple of things. Um, we're going to make a salsa that's as black as coal, and we call it ash salsa. So it has all the stuff that you would imagine in like a pico de gallo or a salsa, and we're going to cook it straight in the charcoal. What's so being used to create this? This is being used to create this. <laughs> yeah, so I, I mean, we're going right in. And 
you're going to see some of this stuff in really dark, like, like you know, sort of edgy Mexican um, uh, salsa negro, so jalapeno. We'll keep it light on the spice. Um, tomatillos, these are real, tr these are everywhere in um, the southwest, less everywhere here. So these probably come a long ways to be with us today. So these are like a green tomato, but they're really acidic. Like if you cut it and taste it, it almost has a vinegar edge to it. So, you know, so when you're... something you need fresh then, right? Yes. Okay. And, and then, you know, too, it's when you're, when you're cooking with abrasive flavors. I mean, this is going to be anywhere in barbecue. You're going to end up with this char and burn and um, uh, kind of heavy, hard to handle flavors. And, you know, what I really suggest is really trying to look at that in, in, in a balancing way. So char and burn, that's going to be on the bitter edge. So you're going to want to add sweet, sort of bring that back, and then tart, and then salt, and you'll find a, a, a little bit in the middle. And so, again, so again, just like the first demo, you're putting st stuff straight onto charcoal. Yeah, straight, straight onto charcoal. So what kind of, I mean, are you worried about, is it it's not quite a stressful gig that suddenly that's going to burn too much, or it's going to, you know, how are you keeping, what sort of time scale have you got looking at those ingredients going in there? You know, that's the fun part, you know. You, well, you're just gonna burn it up. So I think this I goes. I get stressed by this kind of stuff. I think this goes in the whole idea of like, if you think that it's black, then you keep going. So I'll show you. I'll show you. And it makes you know it doesn't make a lot of sense because your 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 mind's like, we shouldn't be doing this. Now these ingredients you're putting into the charcoal directly. Why are they going to complement the oysters so good? Well, we're gonna we're gonna make a couple of things. We're gonna make a. Like a chili, we call it a scampi butter. So it's going to have chili, garlic, wine, um, an unruly foil roll. Uh, chili, garlic, wine. Um, you could put lemon and lime in there, some salt. But I'm going to show you how to work with some of the chilies, which you guys can take this information and put it into rubs and whatever you want. So um, garlic. Yeah. Sounds so good, right? <laughs> it's here somewhere. So garlic's one of those ones that, that uh, you really don't want to burn. So okay. like burnt garlic has a real bitter uh, sort of, you can't come back from that. So I think like roasted garlic, you can roast it in the cloves. But since we're going to be doing this in our backyard and having a good time, I'm just going to make a little tinfoil pouch. And that helps prevent the burn. Yeah, and, and you know, you can, you can move them around. Yeah. If it gets too hot, it starts to sizzle, we can move it up here. We could kick this guy into here and let him be here. And so, you know, my book, I know one of your questions was was um Well, I know Josh did a forward for that book, right? Yeah, he yeah. did. He did. And that's a James Beard award winning book, by the way, guys, which I would say most chefs worth their salt, excuse the pun, own this book. Well, that's nice to know. Well, I, that's what I heard. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us about the book, the narrative, the running Okay, narrative. well, you know, again, it was my story. So I got an opportunity to write a book. Somebody came into our restaurant, and they're like, wow, you're doing some really cool stuff. And it wasn't about doing this fancy, fancy, fancy. So I left a restaurant that I was fried at. And, um, you know, I'd gone through a divorce. I had closed a restaurant. I took another job somewhere at this fancy hotel thinking that's the answer on a redirection. And that didn't work. I started working for somebody else again. And I got to the point where, you know, I started really questioning what, what I'm doing here. And uh, what it came down to was that spirit of hospitality that I was talking about. So I grew up a kid in California. <coughs> and, uh, you know, we would grill out all the time. There's a Rancho California sort of Mexican barbecue thing that's regional there. And, uh, you know, we, we would just cook out all the time. And I was always really excited about it. Those were the best parties I remembered as a kid. And, you know, I started looking at what I want to do this, this round. And so... Well, you said fire was a vivid memory for you as a kid, right? Yeah, yeah. Campfires, um, being outdoors, fishing in streams, cooking eggs in tinfoil on the side of a, of a stream, um, really doing some really fun stuff. And so I got to where, you know, what am I going to do? I did the great hotel stuff. I did the go to Europe thing. I did the go to New York thing. So I really wasn't in a place kind of believing it anymore. So I turned completely to another direction. I had a couple of guys approach me about partnering in a restaurant and they're, they're like, hey, would you like to take like a 40% pay cut and come to the worst part of the city and open this dump restaurant in a 70-year-old building? So I said yes, of course. 
And uh, it was this old motor lodge, and there was an old diner space. And so we went in there, and we, you know, everybody threw their wallet in the middle of the table, and we just did this sort of design on a dime restaurant. And I decided I was going to do everything, you know, from scratch. So it was this cook from scratch thing. So you come here, you get homemade cured bacon, you get homemade biscuits, homemade bread, farm eggs, homemade jellies and jams for breakfast. We did barbecue for lunch, and at night it was, you know, fancier chef sort of stuff. There was some, bar some barbecue edge to that, but everything was cooked over fire. Everything was homemade, and the focus was on the handmade and the high integrity of handmade and homemade foods. And then I wanted to look at it from this American food story perspective. So how do I tell my story as a kid from California who traveled a bit and then is in the middle of Texas? So that's where it started. We didn't have a lot of rules, and we were 100% underfunded. So Was that the flagship restaurant, Smoke? It was. It was. So he loved Smoke so much, he called his restaurant Smoke. Yep. So we had a big 10-foot barbecue pit, huge wood-burning grill, and we just went in there and did it. And, uh, you know, that place was breakfast, lunch, dinner every day but Christmas for 10 years, and we were busy as hell. We would do these Sunday brunches where it was like 500 people would come, wait two hours to get in. And it was, the cool thing about Smoke was it just had this really awesome, it's like you're at somebody's house. So it wasn't about the linen napkins or the crystal <coughs> stemware. I mean, our silverware never even matched in the early days because we couldn't afford it. So we just mixed it up and, you know, put it out. And in that restaurant, you had a smoker and you had a barbecue pit, right? Yes. Okay. So the reliance on gas was less, so there might have been some gas there. There was a bit, yeah, but it was really less. Like, if there was an opportunity to do this, we did this. We did this at the restaurant. Can I give a quote about smoke? Of course. Because I've done some research. The kind of place you could lift out of Dallas and plonk down anywhere in the world, and it would be packed. <laughs> do you concur? I would, I, I don't, it's a nice thing to say. <laughs> he, no, I'm only joking. He didn't say it. So uh, let me talk a little bit more about smoke. Smoke is sure. a This is your words. Smoke is a primer for barbecue. So this is my book we're talking about. And we've about. lost touch with it. That's your quote. Yeah. Well, I mean, at least at least I think in America, um, I think we've lost touch with a lot of. Um, well, you know, I wouldn't say that. I think traveling with the government and stuff put me out there where, you know, we, we get further and further away from some of these traditional things that we, our grandparents might have done. And uh, that's a bin around the fire trick right there. Um, you know, and I think it's nice to, to look back at it. I, I think sometimes everybody gets swept up in what's fancy or what's in trend. And, um, you know, so in 2009 in the worst neighborhood of Dallas, you know, live fire cooking was... Uh, it wasn't in trend. Now, guys, we do encourage questions here. Well, we've got a question over here on the left. Everybody can see Matt Kemp? That's Matt Kemp. He's Matopia Kemp. Yeah. I've got a, a question from Matt for, the, uh, for Tim. Hey, Tim, it's not really a question. I just wanted to say, so, I mean, Tim was here uh, with us in 2013. So our very first event, Tim was brought in by Josh Zersky. And the book that, that um, we're talking about, Smoke, I mean, it's been very modest. It won a James Beard Award. And there'll be chefs here. Um, plenty of chefs here who probably got that book in 2013 and that inspired them. They'll, have it all, they'll all have it on their shelf. But I think probably that book, it's a seminal book and it inspired probably some chefs here may have started cooking because of that book. So I think it's probably a round of applause because that is a, it was a, it's, Thank it's you. a proper, you know, it's a tome. It's, it's funny that, like, you know, that book, it's like you get the opportunity to tell your story and then all of a sudden, like, the marketing people at the publisher are sort of directing it all. And, you know, um, I think one of the reasons that that book was such a success is that we chose to steer off of that. I mean, this isn't that kind of food where you could, um, you're going to smell some chilies. Um, set it to 350, put it in the oven, and come back in an hour. You have to have sort of an understanding of what you're doing. How was your so, phone talking to you? So, you know, when, we wrote, when I wrote the book, you know, the plan was we're going to go blacker. Um, you know, the, the plan was you know, how, how do I demystify this? I've run into so many people who are like, I can't do this, or I don't have the tools to do this, or whatever the deal is. And if you really want to do it, you should do it. And I, and I don't think just, that you're just talking yourself out of it. <coughs> so <coughs> um, when it came down to writing the book, it was like, how do we demystify this? You know, how do we tell our little story about this little weird restaurant in the middle of nowhere? Um, and then how do we tell our food story, and then how do we tell this high integrative handmade, homemade food? So it's a cook from scratch. Um, everything in the book, it'll tell you how to make sour cream, it'll tell you how to make all tortillas, it'll tell you how to dig a hole in the ground and um, roast barbacoa, 
It'll show you how to build an upright pig roaster. And, you know, it's pretty funny because I'll get calls from people's wives about their husbands digging holes in the backyard and uh, Boy Scout troops and things like that. So it's been pretty cool. But um, I think the thing that was great about that book is it, it supposedly what I've been told is that it really broke out of a genre and kind of created this lifestyle thing. So there's all these how-tos. And, you know, we had just a lot of fun with it. Like the, they gave you like an X amount of pages you got to do in order to like publish for the printer. And so we were down and we had one page left that I couldn't put any more indexing in or whatever the deal. So um, the last how-to in the book is how to smoke a pipe, which was really funny because like we just threw it in, took some pictures, and of course the publisher didn't think that was funny. But we, we went with it and, it, and it's the kind of stuff that made it great. You know, they wanted uh, grilling and steaks on the book, and so we went with illustrations in order to please them and put the word grilling in there. But it's about this new firewood cooking. It's about how do you take this, and it's not like follow the rules, do it exactly the same. It's like take this and make the recipes your own and learn how to work with chilies and get out there and have some fun and add a little bit of whatever you know or your, your – uh, you Tim, is there a place for gas? I mean, you mentioned there's some gas in smoke restaurant. Is there a place for gas, or is it all about the yeah. smoke and the charcoal? It, no, there's a place for everything. But it can't uh, deliver the same kind of... No, you could do this at home. Um, I saw some of my beef spice back there. Hey, Liam. Yeah. Can you grab some of the beef spice? I'm guessing that's Liam the son, yes. by the way. That he was about. Everybody give a round of applause for Liam, please. So, like, the spice rubs are really interesting, and we can send that around. You guys could smell it. So we purposely did something that you'd be able to grill at your, you know, at a little apartment somewhere, you know, um, and uh, do it inside with a cast iron and just sear it really hard and get these sort of outdoor spice sort of things going. And, and you know, it was intentional, too, because not everybody has the opportunity to do all of this. Not everybody has a huge barbecue or really anything. I mean, how so do we do, I mean, how <laughs> I mean, you say that, right? I'm thinking, you know, can you actually smoke safety, on, can you smoke safety on the stove? You know, I think it's like get the flavor of smoke. Like, safety can be an issue in a house sometimes. And then, you know, it's going to blow the whole place up. But this is really aromatic, right? And, you know, that's got coffee in it, which is sort of an American cowboy thing. They used to put the old coffee grounds into stews to stretch the meat flavor. Um, cumin, chili, garlic. And, um, you know, you could, you could add some. I had this. We have six or seven different spice rubs in the book. And I did all the stuff at my house because I wanted to do it at like a four to six recipe thing on stuff that people might own versus like custom grills from the restaurant. And um, the, uh, my mother-in-law, who's from Cuba, and if you can imagine the like Ch Chiquita banana lady, do you guys know that? I mean, dude, everything looks burnt, but you're saying it's okay, right? Yeah, no, it's yeah, great. Okay. I'm going to fish out the things that are soft. Um, <laughs> and so like Mimi is not from Texas and is not a firewood aficionado or is, has any part of that, but she'd take these and put them on asparagus and grill them up and uh, on a cast iron or whatever. She'd just make dinner for us and uh, we're going to go more. I mean, s s seeing Mark Parr over there right there, Lord Logs everybody there in the corner. He deserves a round of applause. He sure does. He because there'd be no wood here today at all. The hardest weekend working man in this guy. Metopia. But seeing him makes me think of a question. Debate rages over what best wood to use. Okay. okay. So let's talk a bit about that. I mean, I'm, I'm going to pretend I know stuff here. Hickory, post oak, pecan. You know, okay, you guys see it's boiling in here? But so it's not burnt, but it's not burnt. No, it's browning. So we have olive oil that's kind of doing its thing in there. Okay, hardwoods. I don't really care what kind of hardwood, like, you know, some people are going to be like, oh, you have to do fish with cherry, and you have to do pecan with this, and, and I, it's just really a hardwood thing, so pine, like American pine, I'm not as familiar with some of the woods here, it's really resiny, and, it, and it's like, it gives almost a chemical flavor, I mean, you could use it for lighting campfires, but your, your, uh, your food's going to taste like, uh, sort of kerosene -y a little bit, so I steer off of that sort of stuff. And if that's what you got, you know, you can work around it in a, in a sense of, uh, of uh, using it as a fuel to cook. Yeah. Um, I think some of this sort of wafts in and around.
but I, I wouldn't smoke anything like any of these long smokers here. If you did that with a with a, a non hardwood and hardwoods are normally oak, hickory, um, fruit woods, pecan, cherry. Uh, what else? What else, Mark? Beach. Beach. Birch, silver birch. <laughs> so what's the most popular, what's the most regional wood here that you'd cook with? Yeah. Can we hear Mark? Mark Parr, ladies and gentlemen. Mark Parr, please put your hands together. Thank you very much. Mark, talk about wood. Hi, Tim. Hey. How are you? Welcome it's aboard. Good to see you again. <laughs> um, yeah, so we're really lucky in, in where we are in this country because we can grow fruit really well. Um, and we can, you know, we have a lot of uh, oak down in Kent. Uh, Beechwood is a really hard wood, really dense. Um, that's what we're burning on here. It's mostly what's burnt in pizza ovens. But uh, there's a lot of redundant, and when I say redundant, uh, orchards that are past their lifetime. So we recover the apple wood from those. So you get a great aromatic. And, um, you know, we've got, we got other things. Like you say about pecan and you say about woods like yeah. that. I mean, what you've got to remember is the, those woods that we hear about that sound so exotic, they're almost pest species. So, you know, like Texas post oak grows really, you know, vigorously. That's what we smoke a lot with. Yeah, it's like and it's abundant, mesquite's isn't it? Mesquite's our local thing, and it's, yeah. and it's like the ugliest, gnarliest wood. Yeah. So it's not like you would really, um, you can't use it for lumber. So a lot of times on those big Texas ranches, which are massive, and, you know, these, these sort of places are, uh, you know, family passed down. You know, as large of a place as Texas is, it's like 95% private owned. So you'll have these big stretches where they'll clear all this. And they have cedar too, which is yeah. like a pest. You really wouldn't want to cook on that. That'd be kind of in the pine world. That's yeah. like, yeah. the flavor's too strong. Yeah, they're highly resinous. So it's really, I mean, we read them in books. And we read them, in, I've read Tim's book, cover to cover. Um, and you read about them, they seem really exotic as to us because we haven't got them. But it's, you know, um, it's what's in your sort of terroir, what's in your local terrain. Um, so, yeah, you know, we've we got a lot of excellent hardwoods here and some are blowing in my eyes. Talk about a bit terroir, just people explain, because you think terroir, you think not necessarily wood. How does terroir apply to wood? Well, terroir is a classic sort of term terminology in, in the wine regions so that you know where each vine and each, each vineyard is. But essentially, it's, al it's, it's locating it geographically. So if we think about how the uh, oak grows in, in the UK, so the oak we harvest, we harvest from Kent. So the, the, the land that it sits on is unique in its soil type. So what happens is, if you think of the White Cliffs at Dover, so the downlands that we see are, the, are, cl are white uh, hills pushed up, essentially they're chalk underneath. And then what happens is, in the flat areas, the alluvial plains underneath, you get an oxyous clay. So if you go walking in Kent in those places like that and you see the soil, it goes like a greeny mauvey colour. Have you ever seen that? Where the, the soil goes wet and around the puddle edges you see like a change of colour. And it's where the natural iron, things like that, in the soil, um, they oxidise. And so what happens is an, an oak tree will throw down a really long root to search for water. And underneath uh, the chalk is iron, sandstone. So the, the, the tree feeds off that mineral and helps feed the tree and it, and it becomes part of the land that it's on. So oak from Kent has a high iron note, so it burns high in temperature and has a particular spike in its aromatic. You didn't so say cassia's clay though, no? No, oxyus. Oxyus clay, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, and so it just goes, like, the reason that apples grow really well in Suffolk and Somerset is because of the pH value of the soil. So how acidic the soil is. Right. So we could go on, but this is Tim's show. Anyway, so, I mean, I think it's regional, too. <laughs> I think it's great to, like, cook regionally. I mean, I think if you're in Texas, you got to use mesquite and oak and hickory. Yeah, it's just what we do. If Why you're in um, the Carolinas, they're going to be... My part, ladies and gentlemen. They're going to be cooking on hickory. He's going to stick around. He's going to stick part. around. So if you're, you're in the deep south of America, hickory is going to smell... You'll smell that everywhere. Oh, that totally is. And it's like kind of like the, the lunch bell. Um, all right, let's talk some chilies. So... I know that heat, um, in Texas, everybody eats jalapenos like pickles. Um, and uh, it's just sort of a, a regional thing. Uh, but I wanted to show you guys some different things of chilies. And, and uh, it's not going to be real crazy hot. These red chilies here, these are Guajillo chilies. These are a mild, sweet uh, red chili. They look really hot. 
they're they're really not. So this in a in a in a fresh form will be a long red version of this. And um, what these do is they'll pick these in season, and they would have traditionally tied them up and air dried them all. Um, Pasillas, these are really wonderful. Where are they from? They're, these are all Mexican, southwestern. So pasillas are along green chili. These ones, when they're dried like this, they have almost like a chocolatey. You know, this is in the same family as tobacco. So it's a nightshade sort of thing where, so you can get really uh, uh, robust. There Flavors you go. and smells. Let's have a smell. That? Pass that on. Wow. Look for the hot part, like the warm side. So these guys are going to puff. Pass that round. And it's like the smell of old Actually. Mexico. It's like a movie, like, like six shooters and whatnot. People at the back you know? never get I a I know smell. that's a little romantic. People but at the back never get a chance. It, it, uh, it's true. And I think if you go to any of these like mm, Mexican right. grandmother kitchens, you're going you're gonna to smell those sort of flavors. So I try to, try to do that. Um, you Chipotle, you guys have heard that. I've seen that. So spicy smoked yeah, version of the fresh jalapeno. Mexico. So I'm going to show you guys how to refresh uh, dry chilies and use them in marinades and whatnot. But uh, yeah. I also think that there's two different flavors. Like if I was going to do like something bright and fresh, like make a little like vinaigrette, I would maybe mince the fresh one. And then uh, I would, I would add that because it's almost like it has a fresh out of the garden flavor. And this one is going to have more of that deep, smoky uh, richness. I mean, take a picture by all means if you want to have a look at that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, okay. So these are being soaked for yeah, X Yeah, so okay. I've got a pan going right here. All right, so see how they're like. So what I did is I, I took the chilies, toasted them so that they're soft and aromatic, kind of pull the, the, the top out, shake out the seeds. So the seeds is where all the crazy hot stuff is. Now look at the action over here, guys. And noticing that's going on over here? Yeah. Can so you just talk about what you've, or you, maybe you did when I was in the crab, but what, have you, what are you putting on top of the oysters here? What's I'm going I'm to do one with everybody. I just want to get somebody some food. Um, all right, so we've taken these. We, we've uh, steeped them to where it's almost like a, Woo! like a tea. Put these chilies in here. Take a little bit of the liquid. So this is going to make what? Just a, a it's going to make a chili puree. Right. And then just hit it in your blender. Have we got power to the blender? Power to the blender, people. I think we do. No? Have we got power to the blender? Oh, we went out of order. My bad. That's OK. Just the wrong plug in the wrong socket. How many times has that happened? <laughs> Dude, these oysters look amazing. I mean, how long is it going to take for these oysters to cook? A couple minutes. So he's got these oysters are in the half shell. And there's a garlic chili butter that's in there with the oysters, a little bit of a chorizo sausage, breadcrumbs. And they're going to poach in the shell on the, on the grill. These are awesome for uh, cocktail parties. If you tray up a bunch of hot oysters and pass it out or put them at the corner of your house or wherever you're at, yeah, show them one of those. Yeah. Don't okay. Touch, don't touch when boiling. So, here we are with a super beautiful red chili puree. So what I'm going to take with this is we're going to make a compound butter. And um, can you switch me back to this guy? Swap the blender. God, Tim, I love your energy, dude. So we could take with this guy. Some shallots. Can we just do a shout out where the oysters are from? Colchester Oyster Fishery. Who's the smart arse? <laughs> right, I come up with you with a handheld mic in five seconds. Essex, ladies and gentlemen. All right, so I'm going to put some shallot in here. I'm going to go to my roasted oyster package. Nice and pretty and soft. Beautiful. I'm going to take half of that oyster uh, garlic. But that's from your experience, knowing when the garlic is ready, right? Yeah, you know, that's that, sure. well, you know, it's that whole, like, you got to have, like, a, 
I mean, romance might be the wrong term, but you need to have a relationship with what's going on because it's like the wind changes. And, and I also think you've got to give yourself a break. If, if it chars, it burns, you can cut a little off of here and that. Lemon juice. I think romance is a good term. Uh, some white wine. This is great for shrimp or shellfish as well. And um, what, what we'll do here. Not long to serving, guys, promise. And this time we're going to start at the back. So we'll put some butter in here. And uh, so this is again some, some chili puree. All right, so it's all going into the one puree. So we're going to make a really red butter, a little bit of salt. I know you're back here somewhere. And then um, we'll give it a go on the. More blending noise. Where's the top? Good question. And away we go. So what are we, approximately five minutes of serving, Tim? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, cool. Are we good on time? We have time. Well, listen, if we don't, we're going to wait. OK. So now that's happening. You saw this. So let's get to the. Uh... Imagine if we ran out of time. We said, sorry, guys, there's no oysters. We ran over. <laughs> OK, black as you can get it. It'll be a revolution. In we go. Tomatillos, black as you can get it. Tomatoes. Now we're going to have to get in the dangerous stuff. Pick away the charcoal. Sometimes they look like charcoal. Sometimes they're vegetables. I mean, it's really good news for those who burn their ingredients. That looks completely burned. I mean, these are blue burned. These are shallots here. Guys, if any questions pop into your head while this is happening, please put your hand up. We have a handheld mic. I like the, I really enjoy the whole like your brain is like this is crazy. Because that's when you know you're really onto something, especially if you can make it good. The oil and the, the, uh, the garlic, coriander. It's going to go straight in. I mean, anything not going in? No. It's all going in. Any charcoal in there? No, no. You got to watch that, though. Uh, ground coriander, the seeds, and then cumin, classic southwestern Native American Mexican thing. And we're going to rip this in the blender, a little bit of lime juice. Anybody salivating right now? Yeah. <laughs> Not long. How are we going to okay. serve these on a, on a wooden palette? We're going to have palette. to tray. Libby? Yeah. Libby or Matt, we need to serve up. Can we have you got? Oh, there she is. All right. Can I give, ladies and gentlemen, hang on, Libby. A big shout out to Libby. Libby. That beside, you know, behind the scenes kind of hero, Libby. And Liam. Six foot six. All right, we're moments away, guys. Do you get lots of backache when you're cooking and stuff? Is it really kind of hard because you're so tall? You're gonna, yeah. yeah. You All right, so here's our butter. Lid down. Um, we got our really awesome oysters here. I don't mind where. I don't mind where. Talk to Liam. He'll tell you where. So really great, briny. Kind of free it up from the from the shell. We're gonna we're gonna put our our, our butter on there. And then what happens? So these you're showing here what you put on the oyster before you cook these it. These are chorizo. So we, we put a bit of ground chorizo in here, just because that's awesome. And then breadcrumbs. And then this goes straight on the grill. As easy as that. And then we're going to top it off with this black ash salsa and a little bit of fresh coriander. And you guys are going to have a beautiful barbecued oyster. So let's pick one. Hands up, you want one. Oh. That's approximately 150 oysters. All right. You relax, I'll get you. <laughs> so black salsa there. A little bit of fresh coriander. We got a fresh batch going out? 
And that's it. And we'll have some of these up for you guys. Who wants to be the first person to taste that? Is that right in there? Yeah, that's, that's ready to go. Ready to go? Well, you put your hand up first. You have such a kind face. <laughs> Hang on, it's hot. He needs something to hold that. Here. I mean, it's roasting. We probably need little forks, too. That's going to help. Maybe forks and boats, like from the... Uh, Maybe you got any forks back there? From the event? Forks? Any forks? We got forks. So you put a tray of these out, and uh, you know, if it is too much oil, you can just sort of do one of these numbers. But you put a tray of these out, the oyster shells stay hot. They're going to be awesome for hors d'oeuvres. They're great for appetizers. Um, I love these. Actually, the only thing missing is the black. It's oh, it's there. It's hidden under the leaf. <laughs> so once we have, brilliant, I'm actually going to put a little bit of that in front of this camera. Are you getting a shot of that, mister? Yeah, I was trying to get it back here. Don't worry, dude. Your name's on this. <laughs> so is this informative? Yeah? Do you guys have any questions or things that you think that, you know, I can help answer or demystify while we're waiting to get you some oysters? Who's got a question? Oh, good. What's your name? Uh, my name's Anthony. Hello. Hello, Anthony. What's your question for Tim? Um, uh, the, uh, the chili uh, sort of whiz up you made with the, re with the rehydrated chilies. Yeah. They dried, then re rehydrated. Yeah, so then I'll toast up. them. And then I'll take the back off, shake out the seeds, pour a little bit of water in a pot just to sort of make, make a tea out of it. And you want to soften the, the chili to where it becomes a little bit more fresh. And then at that point, you put it through the blender. These are great for marinades. Like even if you wanted to add it to like, you know, what you normally no, no, might use body. as a barbecue marinade, is it, it gives, again, that really regional thing that you're not going to get from a store-bought uh, and then, just so you guys know, I'm not lying. Here's the one that we made in front of you. Really black, really fresh. Um, the lime, the, the fresh coriander, uh, and the, the, uh, the, the uh, char gets a super earthy, almost like wine sediment, you know, where it's just really sort of, you know where you're at when you're, when you're eating it. But, but, it, but it's, not a, it's, not a, it's definitely a delicate flavor as well. We need to get those oysters out. Question: While we're waiting for the oysters, how Do am I going to fit like through? Excuse me, sorry. Maybe from like the event. Can we get a stack Thank you. Of those boats? <laughs> What's your name? My name is also Anthony. They're, they're oh, they're good. Sort of hot, um, maybe. Is he listening? Or maybe we gone, gone. have them and do both. Uh, no, you ask the question. Don't worry, we'll get him back. Or maybe yeah, the question is. Okay. Um, nah, he's, 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 no, he's good. He's good. He's nah, multitasking. He's multitasking. He's a man. He can't multitask. I know that from first-hand experience. Um, views on cooking uh, on oh. charcoal versus wood. Straight up. Tim, when you're ready. Yeah. Views on cooking charcoal or wood? Um, or both? Uh, I would prefer wood. Um, I use charcoal as a base. So charcoal is a good steady heat. Who asked the question? Uh, this guy here. So steady heat. Like if you want a temperature to stay 300 degrees for Fahrenheit for hours on end, Charcoal is going to be your thing. I throw firewood in here. It's going to go from 300 to 1,800 and then down right away again. Um, I like to cook steaks with the fire kind of like licking up through the grill. I like to char them, and I like to have a cold side. So I'll really almost burn a crust on and then let them rest and then maybe do it again. But uh, firewood is a little bit more volatile, so if that, if that answers... But I would say I probably do more firewood than I do uh, charcoal because fire t burns to charcoal. And you'll have a nice bed of, uh, of coals down there, and then you can continue to just, you know, throw it in. This One of the things, where's Mark? Is he still here? He was telling me how they kiln dry the wood here, which I think was really interesting because it's crazy how fast your guys' wood just goes. So Extraordinary, isn't it? <laughs> Thanks. Now, I know you're all waiting with a bait of bread. This session is going to overrun, but I think it's worth it because you're going to get these extraordinary oysters. Who's got another question? Hello. Oh, you're the girl who had the oyster, am I right? Yeah, that's right. It's still allowed. Still an oyster. What's your name? Dana. 
Dana, what's your question? Um, just about sourcing the chilies, because um, obviously in London we don't always find it easy to get stuff from Liam. Mexico. Where would you recommend getting them in London to do the uh, sources? Tim, did you hear that? No. Over here. Where in London would you recommend to get the chilies? Where would you source them oh from? Oh my gosh, yeah. I'm the wrong guy to ask. Um, I, 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 yeah. Okay, so what is it? Cool Chili Company. You know, this is the age of internet too, so you can you can order probably Amazon Prime to your door, um, relatively fast. For I'm us, they're kind of everywhere. It's like a regional thing. So, what do you think about these oysters? Yeah, I'm going to go ask people now. And can we make sure in the next session, people at the back get some oysters? Those cheeky guys at the front. Hang on, hang on. we can't hear. We've got to hear the what's question. We've got to hear the question. What's your name? John. John, what's the question? Um, lemon and lime. Do you often use the both two together? Because that okay. might mark. So, the question is lemon, lemon and lime. Um, I prefer citrus over vinegar if I can, just because I like the whole natural thing. Um, I have a tendency, if I'm going to make a salsa verde, I use a, a lime just because it's green and I think it has like a, a, you know, there's two different flavors. Lemon is a brighter, sharp flavor. Lime has a bit of a bitterness to it. And um, it really depends on what you're doing. You know what I mean? I think if there's something that's really delicate like fish, maybe lemon. And if you want, really want to do some, some acidy angle on like, like this, like this is definitely a lime. Yes, but I would be yeah. I would say more in the lime world for this. So the question there, is why, why would, would I use, use why would I use the combination? Um they were available like in my bowl. And um you know, I think that that fresh flavor is uh it's it's interchangeable, you know what I mean? Like, if you want to try to mimic a margarita flavor, there's only way you're going to do that with lime. So salt and lime and shrimp, say, you know, then you have these sort of margarita grilled shrimp. That would be where I would head for that. You know, we put lemon in the compound butter because it's a little bit more classic with white wine and lemon and, you know, garlic butter. We've got another question. What's your name? Uh, Jay. What's the question? Um, it's a massive pain to get uh, tomatillos over. Is anything that you'd suggest like an extra hint of acidity? Yeah, I mean, like these are green. These are hard green tomatoes. Yeah. Um, we, we did these as well. And, um, you know, you just add a little bit more acid to it. Yeah. Lemon would be good for that. Who usually does not like oysters has just had an oyster and gone, wow. All That's right. a good show of hands. So talk to me about it. What's your name? Laura. What do you think? Oh, it was amazing. Was it too spicy? No, nah. And okay, I don't really good. like spicy food, so it was really good. good. Where are you from? No, no questions there. <laughs> what, what did you think? It was amazing. I think there was a really good balance there. There was just enough salt, and the kind of god came really through. It was awesome. It was so good. <laughs> you know, you get, you're not going to get the same, you know, that whole like of like the fire burning these shells and, and like creating this smoke and all this. This is... Like, you could do these, and they're going to be great in an oven. They're going to be greater when you do them on your, on your grill, just because it's going to take in all of that good stuff. Guys, we're running out of time. If you have a question for this genius, you need to ask it now. Hello. What's your name? Brenda. What's the question? So there's obviously a few processes involved yeah. in doing all of this. Uh, if I have people coming around for a party and you want these as a hors d'oeuvre to serve, you can op you can prep them beforehand and stick them in the fridge? Yeah, I mean, I, I wanted to do this in front of you guys to show that we could do it in 30 minutes, 40 minutes. And, um, you know, we made the butter for yours last night. We made the black salsa, the ash salsa, for your guys' dishes last night. So this is totally pre settable You could even shuck these things and try them with a nice towel in your refrigerator, pull it out. You can even put the butter on and have them ready. And right before you're going to put them on the grill, you put the breadcrumbs. I'm a big fan. I mean, when I was younger, I'd throw these elaborate deals. You know, I think it was more out of trying to be no, 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 difficult than anything. But, like, having a kitchen full of a bunch of, like, dirty bowls and you're the last one to dinner is, like, the worst thing in the world. So I'm all about staging the game. Time for one more. Well, do you want to ask a question? What's next? Oh, what's next? Oh, what's next for you as a chef, as a person? You know, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of in the gap right now. Um, I've been uh, asked to do, uh, I'm kind of helping some resorts uh, develop like food and beverage 
uh, experiences. So there's not a ton of people who know how to like light up the, we do a lot of fires on the ground. So imagine places like Montana, Wyoming, these kind of vast, beautiful landscapes. And I could go to a resort and show them how to be more Montana and like bring like the element out. Um, I've worked with some fly fishing camps and some sort of like really um, high end, beautiful, beautiful places where they're great at fishing and they're great at doing the stuff that they do. And then we could come in and bring amenity and all that sort of stuff. So, and I'm working on a cookbook too. Um, kind of like my, uh, my path to New Mexico. And I've, I've, my first cookbook, it's called Smoke. Yes. Rizzoli's Everything is called the Smoke. <laughs> right, one last question. Oh, good. Uh, Tim, that's fan Tim, that's great. Thanks for coming over. Um, if so if you are in, your, uh, in Fort Worth, Dallas, where should we, obviously your restaurants, but where should we be eating in the kind of Fort Worth and Dallas area? You know, that's a good question. Fort Worth and Dallas, it's, it's, it's two cities. They, carry, they, are, they call it DFW. There's 7 million people in DFW, so it's pretty big. Um, and so we're a big city, so you can have what you get in big cities, like great little restaurants and boutique sort of things, shopping. Um, there's a great restaurant there currently called Homewood, which does uh, live fire cooking, and uh, Matt McAllister is the chef. Uh, but I think, like, to see the sort of the West, like, you know, it, Fort Worth is great. There's a stockyards, which is kind of the, the end of a, of a cattle Chisholm Trail where they would drive cattle up and um, the American Railway would kind of came through there so this is where they would load these cattle and they'd send them to Kansas and that sort of thing. So there's a working stockyards there so you can see real cowboys moving cattle and stuff like that in the city which is pretty cool. Um, you know there's a little place in Graham he's been which is just outside of Fort Worth called the Wildcatter Ranch and this is like perfect for European travelers where you could come, they have a working ranch, you could ride horses, they have a steakhouse. Um, there's a lot to see. You know, Dallas, Fort Worth area has a bit of everything for anybody. So, I mean, if you want our arts district, it's the, it's the longest continual art district in the United States. So our theater district is just packed and it's like amazing. So Dallas being the banking capital of the American oil, wind and gas uh, businesses, um, there's a lot of money there, and so there's a lot of donations to great things like the, you know, Guys, National we're out of Museum time. Art, uh, we are so disappointed to be out of time. That was an amazing session. Put your hands together, please, for Tim Byers. Thanks, guys. Amazing session. Thank you, Chef. Okay, we're running over a bit, so five past the hour for the next session. Okay, you don't want to miss it. Brian Furman. Well done, buddy.